Hi, it's Cindy and Michael from Part Time Fermies, and we have a few people in the room so far. Um, and yes, the white picket fence made it early. We do have a little slideshow that goes at the very beginning of the show, so give them give people a minute or two to get into the room. But so we have a number of people in. Yep. Want to start off reading it? Who's here? Uh, looks like my mom's here. Yeah. And. Diana from Justice Acres is back in Green Gables, White Picket Fence. So we got a pretty, uh, some of our pretty good regular crew yeah. in there, yeah. Yeah, some of our regulars. So, and there may be some on vacation this week. A lot of people have started vacations. Plus, the sun sets so late right now that it's sort of a yeah transition time, which is actually why we originally moved back to nine o'clock last summer. Um, among with other conflicts, uh, people weren't finishing their day. We just kept it at 9 o'clock. Including us. Yeah. Too much stuff to do. <laughs> yep. With uh, the light out. Yep. So, but I hope everybody had a good week and um, hopefully we'll get a few more people joining in. We're mainly going to have a food day today uh, talking about two primary food topics that I think will apply to the holiday this week. Barbecue and frozen foods. Yeah. So if people want to talk about and, those. And whatever questions you guys have. So you know us, it's free form. Talk about something else. Talk about something else too. Well, we'll start with something else. How about, how about we start with, oh, not that. How about we start with Puddin's new favorite <laughs> sleeping position, which is in the crack between the cushion and the back of the couch. <laughs> she's been doing that recently. That was just nuts that she's it's been so hot i would think she'd get yeah, even hotter she's just been shoving herself there are days early in the week where she was either not on the couch or she was laying yeah. on the floor over here after being on the couch briefly yeah and she could hang out too long too hot too hot and she's been moving from place to place she's on the floor behind us right now not down any bed because it's about 80 degrees in here i would say i think that's what the hallway says anyway yeah um it got to something like 90 outside today and West it does three, that three days at least yeah it does that in michigan it yeah, does we that have a few days weeks a year where we're in around the 90s yeah it's a little early didn't but we hit 100 last year i think we did oh yeah we did a couple, couple times of, yeah um we hit 100 on average every other year for a day or two yeah but 90s we'll get a few weeks in there um i'm not a big fan of 90s I'm not a big fan of 80s, for that matter. I like the 70s. But 90s are okay. It depends a lot on the humidity, mostly. If the humidity is not too bad, you can deal with the 90s. Depending on what you're doing, it's fine. And but, yeah. our humidity has been high. Uh, but it's we haven't usual. had rain in a few days. Things are actually drying out. Amazing. We did the first real watering of the garden all season. Yeah. yeah. Linda joined us, by the way. Linda Taylor. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of hot weather. So I have not been out midday as soon as it gets hot, like it, into the 80s. We've been, and we close the windows in the house during the day. We have yep. enough tree cover that that helps a lot. Get if we shade. get them closed early, uh, mm -hmm. we can reduce the. But our AC broke. Yeah, our AC didn't fire uh, this season. Hi, Carrie. So yeah. Waiting again another week before the local repair guy that we use is able to make it over here and do a little diagnostic on it. Yeah. So. Uh, we have air on the other side. Well, I haven't turned the one on on this side of the house. No, because we keep the door open so the yeah, dog and cat can go we in We rarely house. use it unless we have company oh. or it's really hot and we we usually yeah. don't need it. No, but so we have a fan going behind us trying to keep us a little bit cooler, but it's definitely hot. And we both just had ice cream just before starting the show to try to cool off a little too. But um, yeah, bedroom gets to 80 when it's with four fans going, the white picket fence says. And yeah. Well, I live in yeah, both Memphis and Atlanta and briefly in South Florida, so. But those places usually have they're, AC in Yeah, yeah but they're in, the, they're in the 90s or mid 90s Regularly. or more all the time. So yeah. you actually get a lot more used to it. But. We got into the 90s quite a bit in New York, too, and we didn't we did have any AC there. We did a good amount of summer. But we lived in an old house that was built for cross ventilation, and this house is not built for yeah, cross ventilation. Yeah, cross ventilation. Well, we had AC in two rooms. We did. We had one in the bedroom. And Window occasionally, unit. And occasionally we'd turn around on the first floor in our 
one room, but mostly just the bedroom at night to make it comfortable to sleep. And, and the it dog was, room. It was pretty expensive to run the, the window units. The second one was in the dog room. You want to explain why? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had the St. Bernard, and if it got above 80, he just really didn't do well. No. <laughs> so we actually moderated the heat and the cooling in the house through the year. For the St. Bernard. For the St. Bernard more than for us. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, he, so we had, we had him in a room and created him a lot of times during the day, and so we kept that room uh, right around 80. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, Carrie's AC slash heater broke for a year. Oh, that's horrible. Um, and you say 80s is comfortable. Well, I guess if I got acclimated to 90s, 80s would feel comfortable. But I'm not, I don't like heat. There's a reason I'm not in the South. Hey, Dina. Um, and, yeah, we were talking about weather. Uh, but Puddin has been shifting from place to place. And the funny thing is she came out of the South. She did. She was, I don't know if she lived in Atlanta or if she was, she might have only been in South Carolina with my sister, but either way, she was in. In the heat. She was in the heat. So, and she's like snow as long as it's not too absolutely freezing cold. She didn't, she didn't like it at negative 15. Yeah. She like limited Above her 10 outdoor. 10 degrees or so, yeah. <laughs> she actually did okay down to yeah. zero, really. But, um, and she would still want to go on walks and stuff like that, which by the way, she was asking to do like within minutes of us starting the show she wanted to go out on she's laying down asleep on a walk so hopefully she won't wake up with that but um she was getting all excited because we both came into this room and she thought we were doing something else <laughs> but yeah. that was funny she's jumping around um put a fan in the coop would hate to be wearing feathers all day in the seat <laughs> uh our coop is really our summer coop is really well ventilated so it's kind of road style on that with the whole bottom open and then, yeah we don't have much problem and we have yeah. well right now they're actually fairly shaded because they went into the back the back edge of the property right now so yeah 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 chickens do pretty well with heat but if they're in a barn yeah i think they're i think some fans and things they do a little better yeah if it's not very ventilated yeah i would say that but they are tropical birds originally or they are descendants of tropical birds so um, I think it was Southeast Asia where they originated. So, uh, but yeah, dear mice got our air conditioner again. Oh no, hmm. <laughs> not going to repair it this year until we can solve the problem. Yeah. Mice can, they love the chew on things. Yes. We get them and they also like to nest in any little holes. Sometimes they nest in the truck under the hood of the truck. They do that. And they also seem to like to nest in our, uh, exhaust. Oh yeah, we always get so we always we have a eighty or eighty five percent efficient, you know, um, furnace that has a tip, typical PVC vent. Mm -hmm. and it seems like in the spring, probably because it's warm or whatever, they crawl down the vent pipe. Of course, they can't get out, and they get down into the manifold in the furnace. And it, every year, I pull out. Multiple uh, dead mice. Yeah, two, three dead mice um, oh. before before we start for the winter. Yeah. Actually, I was smelling a kind of a funky smell. I'm like, I think we got a mouse in there that's and it, it oh. stopped after a few days. I didn't, I haven't opened it up yet. Oh. But yeah, I know I can't turn on the heat till I open up that manifold and and clean things out. Suck out whatever's in there. Because it'll it'll auto shut off. If there's anything blocking them. Well, if, if it's in the vent, but all, yeah. they crawl all the way down. Because yeah, they keep sure. going down, and then they end up all the way into the into the heating manifold. But they're dehydrated by that time. I just want them out of there. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And a white picket fence had a raccoon in her attic fan. Oh, jeez. They're gone. Or oh, raccoon babies. We, um, but the fan's broken now. Yeah. They probably chew their way through and just make their... They're really strong, too. So yeah. if there's something in their way, they just push it out of their way. Um, yeah, we find mice in our seed bins, our feed bins for the chickens. Um, we think the lid's on most time, but, yeah, it's not hard. And they get in there, they eat their fill. They can't get out. And, of course, they dehydrate because they ate so much yeah. grain and there's no water. And well, so we've, we've pulled out quite a few over. And sometimes, because we soak our feed, I've sometimes found them oh, in yeah. the soaked feed. But guess Drowned. who likes them? The chickens don't yes. mind having a little extra protein in the feed, apparently. They will fight over the mouse, actually. I moved the baby coop forward a few feet, and a mouse went scurrying from underneath oh, all over inside the coop. 
Did Thank they go after it? Not really. I really, oh. I opened the door because it's getting the water and, and it took yeah. off. But okay. It's yeah. Some of the extra grain in there, I think. Probably. Field nuts, but that's out. That's all out, all the way out in the yard. So. Yeah. Um. Okay. So anyway, we have some somewhat. We don't have a lot of pictures today. Just I oh, had that one. We did have. Um, we're gonna feature some books today. But uh, what I did want to do is give you a link here. Let me actually just pull it up. Um, yeah, so we had a busy busy week aside from the heat coming yeah. in. My dad was, well, your parents were here through Sunday evening. Yep. My dad was here Monday midday for much of the week. Yeah. Uh, working on some projects and doing some stuff. And he was seeing some other people in the general area. Uh, so they were there. And then I made a whole lot of pasta. I had huge amounts of orders going out at the beginning of the week, three different large orders and then of course we're trying to it's busy keep pace with multiple uh, markets so we're keeping up but it's yeah. it's high season so um, trying to keep everything in order yeah so the link I just posted is a link to our kit where we have some recommended chefs books that we'll be featuring today this is the the actual picture of the kit title it's just a picture of one of the cookbook bookshelves that we have. It's a half or a third of one of three bookshelves that are primarily yeah. cookbooks, I would say. Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually half of that because we have four shelves filled of the six shelves yeah. on that one. So and we got another one that's half that size and we got another half of a bookshelf <laughs> that are all all cookbooks or food related books. Tons. And then Cindy's Tons. got a bunch of Forging. Forging and some Most dog, of them are dog training and a few other things. So, yeah, quite yeah. a few books of gardening stuff. I would say the vast majority of the written material around the house is probably food related. Yeah, it seems to be. Not too much genetics left. I don't know what happened there. Actually, some of that's at work. But I anyway. love it's online now. You don't have to. No, you don't have to buy much anymore. Probably. Don't, cookbooks um, are fine online, but they're, it's not nearly as fun as having yeah. a physical book. I think food books are one of the few things where. The physical book is still way more worth it. You can grab a recipe, but you don't always get the sense of yeah what's going on without a physical book. So part of the reason why we wanted to feature a couple of books is because we're going to talk about barbecue. So do you want to talk about these books a little bit first? Well, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Francis Mallman. He became, well, he's been a famous chef. He's a Michelin-starred chef that trained in France, uh, but he has spent much of his career back in his native Argentina. Um, he, so being a Michelin starred yeah. chef means he's one of the, you know, better recognized chefs in the world. Uh, and, and he's probably one of the best chefs in Argentina. Was he the one, the one featured on, uh, um, he was on chef's table. Yeah. 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 So if any of you watched the chef's table, uh, he on was, Netflix. I think in season one or maybe season two, Yeah. Uh, probably season two. Um, he does, um, Patagonia, he's out in Patagonia a lot of times and all over the country and the world doing basically open cooking. So lots of game, fish. Uh, open fire. Almost always cooks on coals or on pits or builds iron contraptions. So it's very crude, yeah. aggressive uh, style of cooking meat and vegetables. Um, and he's pretty inspiring. The things he does and the flavor, they you know, just really push the envelope. But when you're in the middle of almost completely undisturbed Patagonia or mm -hmm. um, you know, harvesting fish hours before or wild game or whatever. Yeah, it's it's not hard to get good food out of that. You just have to yeah. treat it halfway decent. So, uh, yeah, I, I pulled a couple of his books over the years, um, and he's definitely inspiring. But a lot of his techniques, they're not tough, but I'd say they're advanced. His understanding of food is, is definitely advanced. So this one's on fire. He also does, deals with a lot um, of red wine. <laughs> well, let's see if we can put it in front of He, lives, he lives pretty bohemian, pretty, he lives pretty hard. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, yeah. He eats, well, it's a lot of, yeah. He lives out in nature, though, a lot of it. Yeah, and he do, writes a lot of poetry. Everything he does, he's always, he's always, whenever they do photo shoots, he's always dressed and a, around people or around wine or around food. food it's yeah. all, set, it's all seems pretty set because he's sort of like a, a poet of sense. It just feels like everything's very kind of stage. He's trying to set an entire stage to everything that he, he does. This is but, a cool back of the yeah. book. I don't know if you can see that very well, but over the, over the far, is cast iron, I think? A yeah, cast iron uh, steel. It's steel. Steel? Okay. Uh, welded steel. So he does a lot of things cooking on what's called a plancha. 
in Latin America, which has become quite popular. A plancha is basically a heavy steel griddle. So when you think about homesteading, That's cool. it, it, it's if you take the essence of fine cuisine or maybe a huge budget or extra staff or trying to feel very uh, rustic, but sometimes you've got, you're flying a helicopter in with VIPs that are paying thousands of dollars to be there for dinner. Uh, I mean, you got to balance that. But the idea that can you cook on hot stones? Can you cook on a hardwood in the coals? Can you, can you weld contraptions to support meat or to griddle meat and fish? Yeah. yeah I mean, it's very, very primitive. Um, and he's, vegetables. he's just, uh, and he does lots of, They've been very cool things like suspend things on on chains, and they'll roast like whole cabbages and whole pineapples uh, till they break down. You get very different flavors. He likes a lot of char to the point of nearly burned, or I would say sometimes burned, and the contrasting of flavors using the bitter and the burn. Uh, so those are those are areas to really push. He um, did empanadas over. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean you could. Yeah, over, so over. controlling heat—that's what—that's what the definition of food is. Basically, yeah. is control of heat. cooking, not food. The control of uh, cooking is the control of heat, or the application of heat. And as one of my friends says, I don't know who he quotes it from, but it's the application of heat to make things either edible, desirable, uh, either edible or more desirable. So some things we can't eat raw or we don't digest very well. Other things we make them taste much better by applying heat. Like and so, putting yeah. the donut stick over a fire spit. Sticks. He'll do whole. He'll do whole animals. So in Argentina, which is known for meat, uh, yeah. because of the tradition of the Argentinian cowboys, the European descendants and Spanish descendants, and other people that migrated on uh, the abundance of the Portuguese. land. And yeah, yeah, Portuguese, Italian, um, you know, a whole variety of, of other you know, groups. So with this abundance of wild country and meat. Do things like um, Iron Cross, where it's a literally a cross put in the ground, you know, with of steel, and it's over on an angle over a fire, and you hang a carcass spread out with the bones facing the fire to to block some of the heat, and you slow roast, or you do rotational. So it's it's like spit, but going beyond that. And I actually had the opportunity to go to an Argentinian barbecue. I was presented for a whole bunch of chefs by some art. It was amazing. So when you do Argentinian barbecue, it's pretty much meat, probably beef or game, some type of sausage, could have chicken or other things, but it's primarily about meat. There's pro uh, and meat is usually seasoned with some seafood. Oh, they'll do seafood too, and yeah. uh, a lot of a lot of um, brook trout and things. Um, you know, they have ocean, but you have a lot of Patagonia has a lot of streams and cold water. So you have nice, nice um, freshwater nice fish. fish. But in Argentina, you know, my friend George would say, look, it, it's it's all about meat, usually pretty rare, burned and you know, almost burned and then rare in the middle. Salt, maybe a little bit of pepper, limited sauces. A lot of times it's just chimichurri, so chopped up herbs and olive oil mm -hmm. or a, a fried egg on top. And there might be a little vegetable garnish or a little salad or something to kind of help your digestion. Mm -hmm. But it's about meat and it's about red wine or beer, <laughs> and it's it's just a it's a and I guess Texas kind of is the same eating environment to some degree. That barbecue is about beef with salt on it and don't mess with it. You know? yeah. So so it, it it's kind of an inspiring and simple in one way, but it's very very complex and skillful uh, with some of these people. So. Yes, I think over a hundred recipes in each of those books. And he's got about five books that are in English. I think he's yeah. Uh, and we did put these two and he's books. he's French trained, so he's yeah. a balance of, I think what it was is he tried, oh, so his story, if you go back to the, um, to the chef's table, yeah. he had trained in France for years, came back to Argentina and was trying to do French high cuisine in Argentina in the cities. And maybe I think he was in Brazil at times, he's been around. And what he realized was he was importing all these things, they didn't come out right, he couldn't get other things, they weren't fresh. You can't get the flavors exactly when you change continents, even when it's the same items. Mm -hmm. There's the tawar, the taste of the earth changes. And there was a point where he started using native things, and he was kind of like, why am I trying to cook French food not in France? It does, it's not working. And so he started using French technique in this fine dining style, and then they started going into the rainforest and the Amazon, and actually now he has foragers collect the most bizarre things, and he goes on these long forages with them, and they explore and they're like, we're going to do this, so we're going to cook that. And they, they create these now native foraged items 
Uh, and so that's one component that he's become yeah. famous for. So yeah. Oh, it's a really cool book. But both of those are listed on the kit, which I'll repost that uh, link again. So if you're interested in either of those books, I think they're each like about just over twenty dollars or something. And there's a lot of nice uh, stories in there as well as uh, a lot of recipes and how to cook, how to cook those. So you can check those out if you're interested in it. I think those are great for summer cooking because you want to get out of the kitchen. You don't want to make your house hot. And yeah, yeah, we, if you we have a bonfire more, space, yeah. that's awesome. If you have hard wood, of course, yeah. then you can, you can heat up rocks and you can use the rocks to either to cook on to release heat or actually to put items on the heat. Yeah. You basically either you sometimes when you have coals that are, you know, you need something to buffer the heat or you need something to block the, the soot. Uh, other times it has a jacket or a skin or something where you don't need any of the above. You just go straight in the clothes, um, yeah. So, yeah. Hi, Claire. So it's, uh, oh, yep. Nice. 21st birthday. Happy birthday for yeah. your daughter. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So, thanks for stopping by real quick, Claire. But um, And then when you're talking about grass-fed, uh, when you've got wild game or in Argentina and Brazil, most... They don't do a lot of grain they feed on their animals, so your meat's yeah. going to taste different and cook different. So if you dry edge, it's not soaking wet, like a wet edged. If you grass feed, you have less fat, you have different fats. So your flavor and your cooking properties completely change when you change yeah. the handling of your meat. So You're probably not dripping into the fire as much. No, you don't. You, don't yeah. have, you have purged, but you don't have as much purge. You don't have as much water. Things actually cook faster. We don't have a sun. We don't oven. have a sun. Yeah, I've seen um, them. They're pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, no, we, I mean we have in the summer just at well we have a smoking barbecue. Uh, yeah, we have a smoke. We have a pellet smoker barbecue. Yeah. So we use that a lot. We use. I don't cook. He does. When I say we, and it's cooking, it's him. Um, but uh, or you know we have at times, and we do have a few videos cooking over the fire. Mm -hmm. We did some fish at one point, and we may have another one. I forget. So I like to just use some cast iron pans because yeah. they're easy to clean up, and they have good heat buffering. Yeah. They can get too hot. I mean, you got to watch that. But a, a good Griswold or you know a 12 inch or a 14 inch cast iron pan, mm -hmm. you can do so many things with a couple cast iron. Or if you have a stew pot. Yeah. Because then you can actually braise and bake in them and do all kinds of things if, if you move the coals to the side. Uh, and again, a lot of times with even traditional barbecue, yeah. hot coals are stirred separately and you take shovels fulls and you move the coals to where you want them. So you can bring your heat in and out like an oven. You don't necessarily have to forcefully cook over the coals as they're being prepared. Oh, you've been getting a lot of rain and wind in... Uh... Huh. Texas. We've been getting a lot of rain here. We had a lot of rain until about this week. Things yeah. have, have straightened out a little bit. But. Our our April showers were about three months long. So <laughs> Yeah, we've gotten what our full year's worth of rain by now. Probably double our full yeah. year's worth of rain is my thought in three months. I'm it's it's ridiculous. But uh since we got a tenth of it in one night, um yeah. but we didn't have too many nights that were Boy, that heavy. We just got but, a lot of regular rain. We yeah. had a few days with heavy rain, but yeah, mostly. This. They couldn't cut hay because we had so much rain. So this last week, I was driving back from Battle Creek, which is a 30-minute drive, and I saw a lot of people. This was on Wednesday. A lot of people were cutting hay or were just beginning to bale fresh yeah. hay uh, for the first time. So it's all in the fields, like we said last yeah. week. You just couldn't get it cut and dried enough to bale it and get it out of the fields before more rain was predicted. I think the last rain we had was... Last weekend, we've actually gone a full week. Yeah, I think. I think we had a drizzle maybe I don't Tuesday, know. maybe but only I, if I was in work. <laughs> I think it started out yeah. very cloudy on Wednesday, but then it cleared up. But yeah, so we've so the problem was getting, of course, feed out of the fields for those that were moving them around and uh, needing bales. So I think a lot of the people that are um, starving for bales for their uh, for their animals are, are able to get some fresh hay now, or at least fresh, you know, yeah. fresh baled. Yeah, so that'll that'll start solving a little bit of problem. So I will throw out there because we're bouncing around a little bit. Um, if you guys have any specific barbecue barbecue questions, uh, since Fourth of July is coming up, any any questions, any suggestions? Well, the thing I wanted to talk about last week that we didn't cover possibly is if people want to know the differences in pork rib cuts and okay. how they can bet how they might benefit you. We can start with that as anybody lists any questions yeah. they have. But um, 
because we, we had a rack of ribs that we had made for Cindy's family. Yeah. And they were really big. And I wanted to I explain what, what they were. Yeah. So um, this, this is the ribs. I didn't have the whole, I didn't import the whole picture. Yeah. So those one. are just, you know, those are dry, a dry rubbed rib with a little sauce on, which we talked about, but they're, they're pretty large. So people always talk about baby back ribs and there's a lot of commercial activity for quite a few years on baby back ribs. Baby back ribs are the upper portion that are trimmed down and it's the sharp curve on them. And that's actually where the chops would be. So if you're going to a lot of the boneless loins, which became so popular, you're removing all the bones. So you got something left. Well, what's up top after you've removed your full plate is your baby backs. So your baby backs do two things. One, they're nice and small and delicate. You know, they're a couple, they're a couple bites, so you can handle them for a cocktail, especially you know, they're not quite as messy and cumbersome. They're, they, they don't have a, some of the cartilagens on them. Um, and it's just a nice petite. And you can eat a whole rack quite easily. Mm -hmm. But because it's a small amount, they sell for a lot of money. So they're the most expensive. And they have the least meat on them. So, that's what I, so I'll tell you right there, that's probably something I don't buy. Because I don't see the value in them. Uh, if I had the right cocktail situation. But you don't usually cocktail with ribs because they're too messy. Yeah. You'd actually have to scrape them down so you have a handle on them if you're doing a fine dining. So, uh, But if you're doing a barbecue cocktail and you're doing kind of refined stuff, baby back ribs might be your go-to. I've worked at a couple of places where they would never Oh, we would never. <laughs> we always serve ribs on like 4th of July, Memorial Day. People wouldn't eat ribs. And the, the women sticky, in those places wouldn't eat Sticky fingers and yeah. stuff on your face or getting meat or sauce in your teeth. No way. Um so what exactly barbecue is in different parts of the country yeah oh well that's a big question i can <laughs> i'll just that in a second I yeah guess. we'll come back to that. so other other formats you can get uh your trim down ribs or like your danish ribs. by the way the danish pegs it's a little smaller uh, a little different breed they do import a lot of danish and european pork to the united states surprisingly mm. it, it's fairly white and it's tasty it's mild it's tasty and so their ribs are, and sometimes they're very competitively priced in the wholesale. Mm -hmm. I find them really nice for a little more dressed up, higher end barbecue. Um, they're not as fatty. And I think they just take the pigs a little earlier as well as the breed and feed. Mm -hmm. So you can get the Danish ribs and like your traditional boiled ribs and some of that. So don't, don't run away from those. They're a great buy and the flavor is wonderful. Um, but you get a traditional rack which is trimmed down and and so that right now on a special you can get about two ninety nine a pound. Uh could be up into three and change depending on where you're buying it, but your best deals are gonna be about two ninety nine a pound, uh from what I'm seeing around here. And then you can go to your your kind of your full rack or your St. Louis where so your rack of ribs will be a little off angled when you take take the plate off, but you're gonna you square it up. And when you just kind of square it up and you cut down a little bit of uh, where the sternum would be, and there'd be some connection to little riblets and, and cartilage. When you take all that off, that's kind of your St. Louis. So I think for a lot of people that do competition barbecue or want a full plate of ribs, St. Louis yeah. rib is, is your go-to. Now, yeah. the next step is what we ended up with. I got these at Aldi's. They were just a, they were cheap. They were maybe like two sixty nine. This is a full plate. So basically, they cut below the loin, which would leave the baby backs on. And then it comes all the way down to the belly, all the way to the sternum, and so you get two of these off of off of a hog, and it'll and it'll trim it a little bit on the ends. So but it's this, almost the whole. This has like no a half a rib cage. This has no yeah. This is half a rib cage of uh, minus the top up into the loin. Okay. So there's no trim on it. They trim the sides very little, but the bottom had a lot of those little riblets and cartilage. The sides are not as tight. You had some of the smaller rib bones, and I actually had a little bit of the sternum, which connected a few. Mm -hmm. um, and, and pork bones are kind of soft at that stage, so it's not a big deal. So I bought that because I looked at it, I'm like, wow, that's a huge slab of ribs. It was really well priced, and you get quite a bit of meat on that. So that's a little harder to find. That's kind of like a down-home country value cut, uh, but it was kind of cool. So we did that. Yeah. And then the last thing you can do is you can get country ribs. So country ribs aren't really ribs. They're up into the neck. So you're getting some little riblets, but, you know, the smaller ribs are in a... Um, but they're kind of cut through the shoulder a little okay. bit and up into the neck and they'll cut them about an inch and a half thick so it looks like a rib but it's cut on a bandsaw so it'll cut through different material mm -hmm. now they can be from a dollar 90 cents 85 cents in the winter years you know okay. times in the grocery store well they're really meaty now they're not refined you're not gonna have they could have splinters of bone they could have cartilage and other things 
But if you're doing a braise, anything that want pork or grilling, you know, barbecuing, and, and it's just like family, yeah, you get all the flavor, you get a tremendous amount of meat, and they're cheap. So, um, you know, they're that's so that's your cheapest pork cut if you want to do a rib style, a barbecue style, something that's not being pulled that's gonna eat like a rib but not need to be fancy with single bones mm. through it. So yeah, that's that's your um, that's your rib cuts for, so, for pork. That's awesome. If there's questions about the rib cuts, let us know. But let's go back to definition of barbecue because obviously barbecue is very different in different parts of the country. Yeah, so I think barbecue, it's hard to define barbecue, but really? barbecue has an, has an African and or Afro-Caribbean background to mm -hmm. it. Um, I, strong in the Caribbean, like but I would say it really barbacoa. came... Yeah, barbacoa, which is a, a Spanish term or a Caribbean ter term for smoked meats or yeah. cooking over smoke and coals. Uh, Africa, that you can see, you know, going back. And I, I think every culture probably did it, but uh, some of the sauce flavors and the sweet and tart and the sauces we use mm -hmm. and the spices also show uh, uh, some strong connections into Africa and then the Caribbean. Um, so that would be one thing. Um, the device itself, a, a, a grill or a barbecue, but that's probably the least important. And I'd say the most important thing is barbecue to be real barbecue must be cooked over hot coals or, or you know, smoldering coals with some smoke. So... The device is less important that you're using hardwood. Uh, can you do something that's kind of bar so? I use a pellet grill, which I think is probably about as close to a cheat as you can get and still be barbecue, where it's got smoldering, smoking hardwood, but it's not actually whole coals. Whole, yeah. Charcoal briquettes, you can debate. Some people say that's not barbecue because it's the compacted wood, coal, charcoal. Mm -hmm. um, natural gas, yes, you can you can do okay, all these see. things with natural gas. A lot of people will say that uh, natural gas is not real barbecue, so charcoal and natural gas, no, um, you know, turn it. So, so that's that's probably getting picky. But when you're talking about competition barbecue, you're if probably you taking large chunks of briquettes of hardwood that's not charcoal, and you're creating a charcoal. You're creating a cinder and a and a smoldering, uh, or you're using actual you know logs that are that you would get going. And that's why you get that going on a side fire. And you'd actually shovel that in to, or you'd have a pit and you'd, you'd wait for that to burn down before you establish your pit and your cooking. Uh, one to control heat, two to control the acridness of the strong smoke and some of the flames. And so I think that defines barbecue more than anything else. The methods of what you cook and how you flavor and what type of meats, I, I think it's, it can all be barbecue. Um, and, and you don't have to have sauce. In fact, you can just use salt and pepper. Um, or just salt if you want, yeah. salted meat. So white picket fence lives within a couple miles of Kansas, Kansas City. City yeah. So that's in the heart of... Yeah, and I think Kansas City and um, you know, St. Louis and Kansas City and some of those areas are definitely a heart of sort of a red, red sauce barbecue. I live in Memphis, so further south, but I would say it's a little different. Their sauces are different, but I would put them more similar in style. Detroit has a, it actually has its own barbecue. But I would put it also the Chicago, Detroit, St. Yeah. Louis, that, that center of the country has a red and generally somewhat sticky, sweet uh, tomato base. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'd put a lot of similar. A lot of it has to go into African-American traditions and people that migrated from different areas to factories and cities and brought with that uh, and crafted a form of barbecue. So I would, I would put those similar. When yeah. you go to the East Coast, when you go to California – the West Coast, when you go to Texas, you go to Louisiana, flavors and things and cuts start changing up quite a bit. And Texas is mainly defined by its primary beef. Beef is preferred, so that's going to be brisket yeah. is probably the number one. And then beef ribs, which are massively, you she know. She says she hasn't seen any ribs in Texas. Yeah, well, people love it. So you can get full ribs cut the long way, or you can get like short ribs cut, but they're a little harder to break down. Mm -hmm. I've definitely had them. Uh, and, and they're typically salt and pepper, uh, but they take a lot of time. So Texas likes pits in general. I mean, these are all generalities. You can get some really good books on regional, yeah. almost city to city on stuff. But Texas likes to do pits. So they're um, concrete or masonry, large pits, usually over some type of a roof or a, you know, a tin roof. That, something that's not going to burn or a brick room so that you can keep the water off of it. And you get a fire going 
early, early in the morning and you tend that fire. Somebody has to be there observing those coals and the burn down of that wood and uh, moving it around or either moving the meat or the coals around or adding to it. Whether you're doing hogs or you're doing beef, uh, a lot of it's defined by a, a heavy hardwood pit. Yeah. White pick events likes they like burnt ends. Meat candy. Yeah, a lot of people like burnt ends, that's for sure. Um, in that area, and that's Kansas City area again. Uh, that's become quite popular. Yeah, that was kind of a castaway. It was yeah. you know, it was a secondary, but it's become a primary where you know people definitely have figured out that that's, that's tasty. So when you have enough salt and vinegar and sugar and fat and protein and you apply heat for a long enough period of time, that fat and collagen all just kind of start to melt down. And when they melt down into the ends, which are you know, a little more susceptible to the heavy smoke and, and the heat, you start to get a caramelizing of the protein and the sugars, and you truly form something that's sort of like a candy, but it's also intense like candy because it's high, you know, it's Come high on. in fat, high in salt, but you have this stickiness and you have a sweetness, and you get an intense saltiness, and it's just, yeah, it's very intense. So it is it is meat candy. Yeah. Sort of like automatic jerk, you know, jerky made in 12 hours. Yeah. <laughs> And they do charcoal throw in this uh, and throw in soaked wood chips in their area. Well, and that and so that's that's a good way if you don't have a lot of access to hardwood or you can't tend hardwood. That is your cheat. Uh, I'm not gonna and I'm gonna say it comes out pretty good. Uh, so the purest is hardwood, but I'm not gonna tell you that you can't get away with gas and, and chips or mm. charcoal with some chunks of hardwood or chips on it and and soaking them to slow them down and get them to smolder. Um, definitely adds adds flavor to it. So yeah, yeah. And then um, yeah, I was just reading. Yeah, the charcoal from the mountain cedar trees from the 1800s. Yeah, wood is really cedar. I've never had, used cedar for smoking. That's, well, there are different types of cedar trees. Yeah. So yeah, not the cedars. No, I know here. that's that. It's yeah. a strong and a lot of strong flavored woods, hardwoods. Yeah, uh, a lot of different woods are used. Um, yeah. Typically, it's whatever was the most commonly available. <laughs> Everybody fights over, but it was probably what what was yeah. accessible. <laughs> Whispering that the white fake offense loves the barbecue rubs in the Carolinas. I'm a fan of the sweeter rubs. I don't like the vinegar I like, or mustard. Um, I don't like the uh, too straight anyway. vinegar. Uh, a straight vinegar mop. I like a little pinch of sugar in it. I don't like them too sweet. Uh, I can appreciate them. The must. The mustard sauces are interesting. The vinegar sauces aren't bad. Um, the onion sauces are not my favorite. And then the fairly new trending thing is, of course, the white barbecue sauces, which is sort of an onion mayonnaise blend. I'm not a huge fan of that. It's okay, but I, I'll eat it. I just, it's not what I would choose. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Memphis, we did dry rub. We did a pretty complex dry rub as well as you get a vinegar and sweet and sticky and sometimes spicy blend. It's a pretty... So the problem is if you have too much sauce and too much sweet and sticky, for purists, you've covered up the flavor of the smoke. You've covered up the flavor of the meat and the rub. And so it's easy to cheat because you've put all this stuff on top. The other thing that happens is um, that you don't want to smoke it too heavily. A purist wants to taste smoke an essence of smoke, but they don't want to taste only smoke. Right. So you can have too much smoke, for sure. And Tracy says that we use hickory, pecan, and persimmon for the woods. I've heard about, I've never used persimmon, but yeah. I love pecan. Pecan does beautiful stuff. Hickory is nice. It's a little stronger. Any of the nut woods are really nice. But, yeah. And persimmon I've heard about. I don't think I've ever had huh. uh, persimmon. Of course, and then Jamaica, the big thing, part of that people fight about um, jerk is that jerk can be the seasoning, but a lot of people say you can't really do jerk without uh, pimento wood, and pimento wood is allspice tree. And that yeah. if you're not using the allspice tree, huh. not not just the the you know, the herb or the you know the fruit yeah. off of it, yeah. um, that that's not real jerk. Huh. So that again, I think you can get away with making something that comes close, but. Uh, yeah, that would be a pimento tree. Okay, so I do think we're going to interrupt the train of thought for a moment because Tracy had another question, and your mom did put a request oh, yeah, what's at our it? phone call. Tracy asked, how's the baby? Baby's good. I'm almost in the third trimester, and your mom 
because she hasn't seen me since. Oh, yeah. Asked about the bump, which I'm not a big person for doing, like, selfies at all. But I will stand up. Last time I had my sweatshirt on, so, no, it was a little harder to see. But I've, like, apparently in the last two weeks gone from the is she pregnant to she's definitely pregnant and getting comments all over the place. So, yes, there is a bump. I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a bump right there. <laughs> I'm still not huge, but there we go. I have to pull my baggy shirt in. Um, and the pants don't fit. Well, with, all so, the with all the good micro brews around here, maybe they just thought you were spending a lot of time beer at, belly. The, <laughs> at the brew pubs. Uh, no, we did go to a brew pub, but I didn't have but any beer. The, the Michigan, uh, the, Michigan, the Michigan brew belly. pubs. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a beer belly. No. <laughs> but um, no, I've actually, I'm surprised. I didn't gain much weight in the first two trimesters, so it's really, my waistline has definitely jumped up recently, um, just in the last few weeks. For I mean, I noticed it before, but others, you know, you get that question mark where nobody wants to ask because they don't want to be wrong to, oh, wait, she's got to be. So anyway, so doing well, just figured I'd, <laughs> do we get a baby reveal, the gender reveal? We have a video that is coming out this week. So I guess the question is, answer is yes. You will get a gender reveal. Will you get it tonight? Probably what, Thursday probably? It'll probably be mid Oh, well that Thursday is actually 4th of July. So yeah, it probably, probably won't no, be Thursday. I'll try to, let me try to get it together for Wednesday. I'm going to aim for Wednesday, but I won't release it on the 4th of July. Yeah, It'll be so Wednesday, Wednesday or Friday. Or Friday. Um, so, <laughs> so your mom says, thank you for the bump picture. <laughs> um, so to interrupt the barbecue discussion, <laughs> um, but no, uh, so we will do the reveal this week. So you'll have to, you know, hit the bell if you want to see that video. Um, we did tell your parents today. Um, we told my parents and family last weekend cause they were here last weekend for my dad's birthday. Um, so I did catch a little bit of both of those reveals on video. So we'll just put all that together and release it to you guys. So hit the bell if you want to know gender, uh, cause that will be coming out soon. So anyway, to, to interrupt the barbecue discussion. I, I like the, the white barbecue sauce is a sacrilege. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm definitely towards that, that camp. Uh, it's really trending because I think it's something different. What is it like dipping wings into ranch or something? Well, or no, it's cheese? a puree. It's, it's just... a puree of onion. It's almost like a mayonnaise dip. Yeah. And I could see how that would fit, especially in French cooking with mayonnaise things being used and it's mild. Um, I'm not loving it because it's nothing I, I ever identified with barbecue. Uh, I guess if it's made really well. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, so grilling is one thing. I think barbecue is talking about slowing it down. And for diehards, it's, and there's all kinds of barbecue videos and books and really some good experts. I think we've defined and understand barbecue in the last 10 years better than we ever have. We've started to catalog old timers that have been doing it as tradition, passed down family tradition in the backwoods of all over America, and I, I think every area has its its styles, but um, but yeah, I think there's, um, there's something about really you know hardwood going slow, slow taking some time to needing to attend to it, whether you're turning the meat or wetting the meat and cooling it with a little water or vinegar, and having moving smoke. the coal and having some level of smoke, um, <laughs> and, con and really doing a lot of chemical conversion over a period of time. So yeah, it's. Um, you can go, you can really get serious about, uh, and a lot of people, they do, they make it there. It's a weekend activity of, of tending that meat. Uh, but yeah. again, some wonderful, wonderful videos and documentaries out uh, on some specialty stuff. And I would say Carolinas are definitely a hotbed of specialty stuff. Uh, Austin, parts of Texas, but Austin has some amazing things. And as some yeah. of the, uh, the parts unknown, I think they did some barbecue and so you, know, you, you don't really get it in the city. We're getting it closer, but you got to go out to the backwoods of some place yeah. that looks kind of dirty in the middle of nowhere. And we found a really good barbecue place in Vermont. Yeah, he's pretty famous, actually. Out of a 
broken down school bus. School bus that was pretty much sunken into the ground yeah. off uh, exit off the highway. I always forget I, I, his name, but yeah, that was fun. Um, yeah, he had two school buses. He cooked out of it like a food truck, but it sure wasn't going anywhere. No, no, and, it was um, yeah. yeah, an older African American guy who says we were talking with him, and he's like, "Well, how do you end up here?" He goes, "Well, I heard there's good money picking apples." And he said he picked apples for a season or two, and this was 20 years or more ago, and. Yeah, he's in the middle of cheese country in nowhere in Vermont. He's like, nobody Make had barbecue, awesome barbecue, and I started cooking some barbecue. Yeah. I missed it. Yeah, yeah. So he started his making His daughter it was working. Yeah, this was a number of years ago that yeah. we were there. But oh my gosh, this has been. A he while. was like, I missed it, and I started doing it, and one yeah. thing led to the next, and he, you know, he had, and he's notable. One thing, he's out in the yeah. middle, and nobody else really had that type of product. Um, but I, I, we ate a couple of things there. I'm like, this is good. <laughs> so. So I did want to say thank you for the some of the congrats that came through, by the way. So, um, and we have a number of people in the room. Uh, yeah, we love finding places. All the hole-in-the-wall places, I love the hole-in-the-wall places. Um, but uh, little family joints or little just well, off the highway. Some of them are pretty scary, either food safety or mm -hmm. generally what they're... We have places around here that I don't know what they're doing in the kitchen. That's true. <laughs> food, I don't even know about the safety end of it, just what they're putting out. But, but you know, more... The ethnic, some of the ethnic stuff, yeah. and um, finding the right tamale place, finding the right, right. barbecue place. All right. Yeah, so. they're never in the good neighborhoods. <laughs> they're always out in the middle Except of nowhere. Except your favorite where... Vietnamese place. Yeah. They're in a good neighborhood. <laughs> it's sort of more modern. It is. Thing. Yeah. It is. But um, so what I, you know what? Let's change topics again. We kind of went through a lot yeah. of barbecue. Um, I did. It's the last day of the month. And it's 9.45 already. And we actually have quite a few, well, yeah, about 20 people in the room, I want to say. Or was it 18, 19, 20 people in the room? Um, and we haven't done a giveaway this month. So we have to do a giveaway. Now, we do have rules for our giveaway. And I'm going to link this with something uh, you guys, if you're interested in, obviously, any of our giveaways, you can always potentially purchase as well. But... Um, we did put together a new set of merchandise, basically, on our Teespring account. So I'm going to link that here um, with some forging. Oops, let me get back to our page. There we go. With some forging uh, items here. And so what I did was we're starting a series of items that are forging related. So... This is the back of the shirts that of the newest shirts. Um, so a number of my pictures that I've taken of different edible and medicinal mushrooms, and uh, okay, what we'll do. Gotta get one of those to Navi. Should I get one? I, yeah, should, we should probably order one. one for her. One we could do that. She gives us stuff all the time. Absolutely, we she have just so gave many. Me a whole quart of spring spring onion uh, kimchi at the market this week. And we we she taught us most of these. Yeah, yeah. Um, or she verifies the ones we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so so we do have that the, uh, some shirts with that on and a coffee mug with that. I'll probably add a couple different. There are some other options that I can add to those merchandise things if you like, but. Um, that is the new series, is with that on the back and the Part-Time Permies logo on the front. Um, but for the giveaway, we'll give away one of the t-shirts, either the women's or the men's version, or the men's is really unisex, so it could be either shirt um, coming in various sizes, various colors, so you'll have to pick out what you like from the site if you win. Now, of course... I need my notepad because our last three winners, last three months, are not well, well, eligible. She, just, she ditched out for the birthday, birthday party, so, so Claire's not in the room right. anymore. Carrie won in April, and Crystal... Crystal, I haven't seen unless she's not chimed in. Yeah, so Crystal won in March. So, Carrie, sorry you can't win. You could guess if you want, but you can't win it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, my question, I'm going to pull this picture back up. Can you name two of the mushrooms on this T-shirt? First person to name two of the mushrooms as we see it gets the gets the uh, T-shirt, and we'll have to send us a message. Can you name two of these eight mushrooms on this picture? Don't say portobello. No, <laughs> uh, built on the rock. So curious as I posted a mushroom video this past week. Huh. My rabbit hutches, huh? Talks it, so not eating. No. <laughs> No, there's a lot of mushrooms I really don't know. Oh, yeah, we know um, kinds of stuff. We know, well, only the ones we know well. So 
I'm going to keep this picture up. I know there's a delay on chat usually, but I'll keep this picture up until I start seeing things coming turkey in. Turkey and morel, I think that might be okay, right? <laughs> turkey, turkey and morel. But it's not the whole names. Those aren't the whole names. Um, morel and chicken in the woods are because it's turkey tail and morel. Correct. Uh, so I think we'd have to go with morel and chicken of the woods because chicken of the woods is um, upper left. Yeah, that and, was a nice one off yeah. our tree. Yeah, yeah it comes back every fall. And then the morel is the bottom center one. So, so rustic traditions. Rustic traditions, I think, got it. I'm sorry, white, the white pig fence. Turkeys, just, I think I have to have the whole name on it. Turkey <laughs> it's tail. not a turkey. All right. <laughs> we got turkeys in the back sometimes. Yeah, but those aren't mushrooms. Wow, that was close. Um, yeah, so you got a number. Right. I wasn't, I was actually debating how many I should require because there's probably a couple on here that are harder. easier and some, some are harder. harder. So, um, so I would say rustic traditions homestead. I'm going to give it to you. Um, Linda Taylor almost had it as well. Uh, got, also got the turkey tail and that, and I think rustic tradition also got the spelling right on morel. Um, yeah. Uh, you so, know what? Hold on. Confusion. It's not a chicken. It's not a chicken of the woods. No. It's a hen of the woods. It's a hen of the woods. You're right. The chicken of the woods is actually orange yeah, and grows up correct, on the tree. Which we haven't seen much So yet. we don't have that in the picture. So I'm go, sorry. So you're going to go back oh. to... No, hold on. Who's the first one? Okay. So white picket fence said turkey and morel, yeah. but didn't get the full turkey tail. Rustic tradition yeah. got morel, chicken of the woods. Tracy, but morel, not. and hen. Linda got morels and turkey tail. Morels isn't spelled right, but she got both of those. Turkey tail. Yeah. yeah. And then Tracy got morel spelled right and hen in the woods. Hen in the woods. That's not quite right either. It's hen of the woods, but it's so close. It's close enough. <laughs> um, 13 moons said only morel. Um, so I would say, you know, would you count Linda, even though the morels isn't spelled right? Because that's the first one that came through that had two of the correct ones. Yeah, I don't know. I think, <laughs> I think we have to count Linda okay. on that one because this All is right. the first one so. that came through that... I'm not going to worry about spelling. I'm horrible with it's, spelling. It's like the uh, casinos. They reserve all rights <laughs> on all their commercials. So, I guess so we had to the analyze to that. Choice. Oh, my gosh. Sorry about that rustic tradition. Has Linda it's, ever won anything? Um, not recently, if she did. Linda, have you ever won anything? I, you're not on our list. I'm looking nope. at the list, the 2018, 2019. So it's all the way going back to August there. No. Nope. I don't think you have. All so right. Linda Taylor, you're the winner. I'm uh, sorry for that false false information initially because so that's for the rest of you. You gotta buy swag, whatever, whatever the swag that's offered on what is it Teespring? Uh, it is on Teespring. So um, whatever they are, whatever price they offer, we don't set. No, the no, we do set the prices. We do set the They're twenty dollars a shirt. Okay. They're twenty dollars a shirt. Um, I forget what the mugs are, like twelve or something. Okay. Because we can set how much profit we want on them which we don't there take much. which i know i a couple bucks per shirt basically a few bucks and it depends on how many are bought to actually you get a little better profit margin if more people purchase but which we don't sell very uh, many. no i don't i don't care i'm just i'm just having fun with the t-shirts um so right. okay where'd it go um do, 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 do. where'd it go yeah but we got to order one for linda taylor for Navi then. and we have to probably order some for ourselves too um Maybe I'll love that. She'll go foraging with that one. So Linda Taylor, you can either email, email us or send us a message on our Facebook group or page uh, with where to send it and the size. I did just uh, post the Teespring account again. Um, <laughs> I know, rustic traditions. I always get the hen of the woods and the chicken of the woods mixed up, but they yeah, are two no, different mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. Um, hen of the woods grows at the base of oak trees later, mainly yeah. in the fall on white oaks, chicken of the woods will also grow on hardwoods, but they grow usually on the sides of the hardwoods or, or fallen logs or on fallen logs yeah. or on stumps, yeah. that sort of thing. And they're, they're big all they're hen both they're big mushroom, but they're orange, they're orange. Chickens are orange and hens are actually range from gray to brownish, yeah. but okay. So you guys, <laughs> sorry, I'm talking so fast on that. Um, you guys want the list of these. If we go to the left to the right on top, the top left is the hen of the woods, not the chicken of the woods. That is the hen of the woods. And I think it's named after the kind of like a feather-like appearance 
as they layer over on, on as it grows. So each uh, little cap, it almost kind of represents the end of a feather. Mm -hmm. The one in the middle top is the turkey tail. So that is a very colorful little mushroom that's more medicinal. Um, and my picture here is so small. Oh, it's a jelly mushroom on the one on the top right. It's a, uh, so, and there's, a, and I'm actually blanking on this specific name. There's two jelly mushrooms that are edible. Um, bottom or middle left. What was that? Huh. It's, middle, it's an oyster, right? Middle left is an oyster. Middle right. We just learned it. Oh, that's the, um, Shaggy Mane. Shaggy Mane. Yep. Shaggy Mane, bottom left. Do you know that one? That's the old man or whatever. Old man of the woods. Yeah. Um, and that's a bolete. Um, bottom middle that that's most people know. That's a pretty matured morel. That's a tall morel. Bottom right. Is that a stinkhorn? I can't no, really see it's, it. Yeah, I know. This picture is small uh, on our screen. It's half an inch. Huh? <laughs> it's sure. a little medicinal mushroom that... Oh, that's reishi. The reishi. I was looking at the orange and envisioning it different than... Yeah, yeah that's so the reishi. Small reishi. So, yep. So we have eight of them there. And we have covered other ones. Those are the ones I actually found decent pictures of so, to make a good t-shirt yes so seven out of the eight are edible or medicinal and not all of them are edible oh, or medicinal. the jelly mushroom is that one is also edible as well um you can That's a soup we mushroom. haven't had it, it eaten it it's more of a soup mushroom it's kind of well jelly like um more eaten for the texture in soup mainly in asian soups yeah um than anything so we haven't tried it because I'm not a big texture person and the jelly just doesn't sound good to me, but it is edible. Um, the middle right is the last one we've featured so on our live show. Curie, with all your heat and dry, you may not have a lot of mushrooms. Yeah. You're probably going to get any edible or non-edible. But she's in, been wet recently. In the winter. I'm going to guess primarily in your winter. Yeah. Because that's where the temperatures are more moderated. Yeah. Or growing on animal feces. Yeah, you can get that, but whether they're edible or not is well, a lot of those either hallucinogenic, not edible. <laughs> yeah, that all kinds um, of stuff. Yeah, so and, and a lot of, if you don't know they're in you in there, yeah. Yeah, uh, a lot of the edible ones. Actually, I didn't like. I personally don't like grocery store mushrooms, and never really liked mushrooms. Um, I like them all. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, I like portobello is okay. Uh, the white. Mushroom and from I the grocery store. I just bought some organic whites because they were cheaper than the regular. Costco had them on super if special. If they're cooked, well, if you if you sear them hard yeah. and brown, it changes the, the, the cooking preparation. Better. I actually like to take the white ones and shave them super thin on a Asian mandolin, and just layer lots and lots of uh, real, real thin shavings over like a salad raw. I don't like them raw. Yeah, um, and all the wild ones you never eat raw. No. Uh, so all the wild no, ones you, have you might, to be most, cooked. It's, it's rare that, that we eat the cultivated ones. We can eat them raw because generally you don't eat mushrooms raw. Yeah. And the white pig fence, yeah, the spelling thing with autocorrect is correct. Yeah. <laughs> I realize a lot of people are on cell phones and it doesn't always, it sometimes wants to turn morels into morals. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's surprised you even came up with those two. <laughs> uh, that was pretty good though. And I'm just catching up with the comments. Sorry. Um, I don't know about mushrooms I learned from me. Oh, wow. Thanks. Yeah, don't I can eat make them. a mushrooms pretty much. No. I could, if I could have a, a large, certain types, I could have as the primary. Use a little polenta or a little bread stuffing or something, yeah. and I could have the main, pretty much the main meal to be mushrooms. I've done that with like portobello burgers. Yeah. But yeah, that's about it. Um, or, you know, I've had it as the meat component in a way of like a stir fry or something Chicken like that. liver and saute. That sounds pretty good. I think my mom would agree with that. <laughs> so some, would my mom. Some good mushrooms or even <laughs> marinated vinegar mushrooms and a, a decent chicken liver pate yeah. or, or sauteed chicken livers. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, Maybe some yeah. bread with that. So we have a funny picture that we throw in. Oh, yeah. A different topic. So read Change this. Topic we, I just saw this a few minutes before we started the live show. It was listed on our I local. I thought it was a spoof, but I think it's actually a, a, you know, from the 60s. I think it may be real. This is nuts. <laughs> so Look at this This went up on our permaculture page. People this, were freaking out. What the heck were they thinking? <laughs> this is nuts. You guys read that first. I, I would yeah, blow it up and read it. it. 
Yeah. Um, so that was in Popular Science. It says, I haven't verified that it's real and not yeah. a, a, spoof, a spoof. Yeah. But it might have been. That, I mean, I, I could kind of see it because, you know, yeah. people didn't have ways to get rid of things as easily. Um, and the comments are still coming through on the mushrooms. So I think yep. they have a lag here. But, uh, yeah, so this one is not... Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> there's the first reaction. <laughs> oh, permaculture at work. This is, uh, can you believe how, how much oil did they put in the ground? If that's well, everybody crazy. dumped it in the sewers and dumped it all oh, over for years. It's true. But uh, well, and what you think about it. So the oil is not particularly good. It's probably not the worst thing in the world, but it's the insane. oil filters the engine. And so it's you've got so all dirty. kinds of other combustion stuff. And in the sixties, you're running a lot of leaded gas and you had leaded fit it. So this is real. I've seen people do that years ago. Well, yeah, people definitely yeah. did. Yeah. So I would say that you would have a lot of lead or possibly mercury or other heavy metals even yeah. at that time, even more than we have in our oil now. Kind of scares me as to <laughs> what is in our soil, you know? Yeah. Well, oh my God. Everybody behind their barn or behind their garage or shop. Yeah. Seep into the water supply. Yeah. Now, the one thing is a break. If you're going through enough soil, you do get, and you there are some it. bacteria that will eat a little bit of oil, but it's it sure isn't easy. No. Yeah. Uh, it might depend on soil type, yeah. too, because we're on sand. I wonder how much that might filter it a little bit better yeah, than the other soil. You get it to break down. If you're dumping very much of it, it's. No. Uh, that was nuts. But that came across on our, uh, yeah, our local permit. Our local permit, uh, yeah. Uh, page. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, and similar reactions to that. Yeah. It's yeah. Do that, you know, every time you change your oil. How much oil Well, are you? and you were changing your oil every two or three thousand miles at that point, yeah. not the eight, ten thousand that we do on a lot of cars now. Yeah. Um, although if you talk to most oil shops, they still want you to come in every three thousand well, miles. Oil shop does of course yes. they come in once a week. You don't have to, by the way. Um, uh, unless you have a really old car. Barbara wants you to come in once a week and get trimmed and shaved too. Sure. Anyway, let in the paint. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, kids from the 60s. We actually have quite a bit of environmental contamination around here. Kalamazoo had a lot of factories and machine shops, uh, paper mills, chemical production, um, up John laboratories and a variety, you know, a lot of there's you know, a lot of good industrial, a lot of money was made, but either through cost or lack of understanding. Uh, there's a lot of paint factories here. The, the yeah. culinary school is built on a paint factory, which they decontaminated. Their growing area, they can't grow on the soil. It's actually all been Raised mitigated, beds. and they yeah. put a clay liner, took out three or four feet of soil, put a clay liner in, yeah. and they're trying to look at how to reclaim that soil, but they're actually growing all raised beds. Yeah. And in one way, because it's a learning program, it might be smart to figure out how to reclaim and you know, what items can they extract and can they bring it back to growing conditions because it's a test plot. But, yeah. yeah, they don't eat anything coming. So, uh, and the Kalamazoo River had uh, PCBs um, from big GE plant up in Grand Rapids and then um, paper there. And then we also have, right now we have a lot of, um, what are they finding? The um, chemicals that are in Teflon, PFAS. the PFAS, PFAS contamination. All over is, Michigan, but they're studying Michigan. Yeah, too. so people are saying Michigan is the worst, probably the worst state in the country. No, it's but the it's, first one studied. It's actually the most intensely studied. Yeah. Probably it's not much different than most other industrial producing areas. Yeah. But we did have a lot of um, shoe and boot manufacturers, um, and we have like military bases with you know fire retardants and so yeah, it's. Uh, you know, I don't think Michigan's in as bad a shape as many places, but there's definitely areas around our town, not so much where we live, but around the downtown and other things where there's definitely been issues in a lot yeah. of cleanup. Although it's a lot better now than it was just a few years ago. So, Did we want to, it's already after 10. Do you want to go over the frozen stuff a little bit or well, at we least could, talk we about could the preview to, We could preview, preview so, next week. So what I was thinking, so the ribs last week was kind of like, well, do we really know the... We buy ribs and we have different ways of cooking ribs. But instead of talking about that was how do we, what are the cuts when you go to actually purchase them? What's useful? So sort of on that vein, uh, we could talk about our just sort of weight on frozen desserts and what makes, um, yeah, Flint's actually not much worse off than Detroit and things. Uh, many of the cities around yeah. here. It's gotten a lot of attention. Yeah. Not that it's good. 
and they've corrected most of the water issues uh, at this point. But as far as the site, you know, sites, there's sites everywhere. Yeah. Uh, the PFAS goes all over the lower peninsula. Ann Arbor is actually having a lot of problems with uh, dioxins and, and floating, yeah, PFAS and dioxins floating through the aquifer and the watershed across a large portion of the city. Again, a lot of that's due to intensive testing and knowing it's there. Whereas in other areas, people just don't Probably even don't realize it's there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's so Flint. Flint is de and Flint is a low tax and a poverty area, so it's been ignored and it's also not covered with as much financing to help with these things. So so they take the brunt of it in all all ways, and so does Detroit. Uh, but Kalamazoo's not a wealthy town. Um, it's sort of it's a very middle class yeah. um, town. So yeah, a lot of and most of Michigan is so a lot of uh, things going on. Yep. So, one other featured book, going back to food. Uh, frozen, oh, you can hardly see this. It's glaring. Um, there we go. Yeah, frozen there's desserts. A, there's a frosted cover on it. Yeah, there is. So, this book came out uh, probably 10 years ago or maybe more. It was pretty groundbreaking at the time for American cooking, and it was put out through the Culinary Institute where I attended um, yeah. a little bit after I was there, but it's called uh, Frozen Desserts 2008. All right, so, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was a combination of Francis Magoya, who's an amazing chef, instructor, came from Spain, I believe. Well, he might have been Portuguese, but I think he's Spanish. Um, really knew a lot about molecular cuisine and using modern ingredients to accomplish techniques and pastry work because you have limited portfolio of flavors and, and ingredients. Being able to play with the texture and the form of it um, changes. So he was, he was very strong in that area. He's a very notable chef. Uh, so he wrote a whole book on frozen desserts. And so what we wanted to talk about at some point is the different types of frozen desserts and what distinguishes them or how you create them. Because we don't think about that a lot. It came up, Cindy was watching an old thing, video. No, it was a video Carrie posted Carrie up, on our page, up. on our Facebook group. Oh, yeah, this book's it in was, print. Yeah, so this this book's in print. It's not the cheapest of these books. Um, you can probably get it used in expense. It was not cheap when it came yeah, out. Yeah, on right? Amazon, I think it's like fifty dollars. I think yeah, and it was like um, eighty when it came out. But yeah, I, at least yeah. Check, check a, Abe books. I find Abe books for used books. Abe A B E or yeah Abe. Yeah, uh, I find to be vast supply of used fishy cookbooks and some of them very inexpensive. It's a compiler of sellers. They do the same thing that Amazon does, but I think they do it more efficiently. Yeah. So. so Kiri, by the way, posted a video on our Facebook group. Um, and those of you guys who don't match up Frozen names. Chocolate to, pie. That sounds all right. Yeah. Uh, Kiri is built on the rock homestead here. Uh, but she posted a video on our Facebook group that was done by, what is it called? An Antichrist? It's something. It was a pair of people. I forget that. Um, no, I don't have the. Uh, so they were doing old remember. recipes. Um, you know, there's a bunch of channels that like to do old recipes and revive them and um, sometimes terrible, um, terrible yeah. old recipes and just kind of show how terrible some of these ideas were. Um, so she was watching that this afternoon. We'd missed it. Yeah, from when I she missed it a couple it. weeks ago. And I was going, oh, I've seen a couple of things like that. And I was watching what they're doing. And it's not actually a terrible recipe. I think they could have handled they, a little better. They skipped a couple of things or at least yeah. one thing. It, um, I think you could clean it up pretty easily. So it is recipe archaeology. That's it. And it yep. was a diet dessert on a lemon sherbet. Yes. Um, lemon buttermilk sherbet. And so yeah. I don't know if they're trying to cut the fat, cut the calories, what yep. they're, what exactly they're total, totally trying to achieve. But you would have been in the early days of structured diets and dietitians. Archaeology and, antique. You know, okay. So, um, um, yeah, so that was... Um, so we were watching that. I said, "Oh, well, you know, that's something we should talk about is frozen desserts. frozen desserts and all the various things that you can do, and a lot of them you can do at home. Yeah. Um, and what makes you know what makes a ice cream from a sorbet and a gelato and a sherbet and a semi fredo and a uh, you know there's all these different you know custard you know, frozen custards and ice milks and yeah. and stuff. And so that would be something that maybe we'll wait uh, towards." Maybe do it next week. We got a lot of hot weeks coming, but yeah. if that's something of interest to understand how to make some of those or how you differentiate them. Or for that matter, how you can kind of incorporate some of your own grown things into them. Like and you can, yeah, because you can put all kinds of herbs and vegetables. You can get really neat 
fresh flavors. Your fruits, your berries. You can do your... most of this at home. You can do most of it inexpensively. You can do them gluten-free. You can do them dairy-free. Um, and then another thing I talk about is ice cream and why one ice cream is four or five dollars a pint, uh, or, or you know, a, yeah. a, a quart. Well, they're not even quarts anymore. They're three quarter gallons. Yeah. Um, and then you get an eight or nine or ten dollar pint, uh, and some of it's what's included, the, the garnishes, and they're expensive. Um, but how how an ice cream can change. Uh, the, the makeup of how it's produced and the ingredients to change the texture and the cost structure and even some of the eating properties. Uh, so those are things that if you're interested, you could shoot some questions and we can yes. break a lot of that down. Yes. So, yeah. And then yeah. Uh, using mint in your frozen desserts. Absolutely. You, I do a lot of things like, um, you know, mint, mint, grapefruit, um, granita, granita, mm. or granite, depending, on if you're, depending on if you're French or, yeah. um, if Italian, and then sometimes putting things in, like a little verm. You can use some of your lesser-known liquors that people don't really drink because I don't know why you drink a lot of them, but they're great for pastry work, like um, aromatized things, vermouth, uh, chartreuse. Um, you know, there's just all these flavored herbal and plant-based things, and that you can, yeah, that you can produce, you can change, you can take something that's too sweet and you can bring it back in balance. By using the right flavorings and herbs. So, yeah. Watch the Townsend's, and I've seen a couple of the Townsend things, not much. Uh, and he pulls up pre revolutionary recipes. I tried one for fried chicken, supposed huh. to be about 300 years old. Well, and I don't it was know if good. it's changed. I don't know if making a good fried chicken has changed a lot, other than it would have been gamier and you would have had to cook it a little more. Yeah, I mean, technically, if you use modern chicken in it, it'll taste probably more like. Well, you, you, may have to cook, you may have to cook it more. I have a recipe yeah. that I use for sous vide chicken. Yeah. Could account, I could take a game bird and using that and then fin and then doing the fried chicken, I could get an amazing result from any yeah. any bird. But that's sort of a modern technique. Yeah. So, yeah. So why don't we say we'll come back to that topic so next week? So that's a teaser. Yeah. Yeah. Teaser for next weekend. Teaser for the baby gender reveal coming out this week. So if you want reminders, hit the bell down below below I think on your computer screen if you're in the chat room on your phone you actually have to close the chat not the whole window but the chat and hit the bell that's underneath that um, and then uh, if you want your notifications to come through they do sometimes uncheck bells so always double check that they're checked off there's a lot of checks and, and um, burn, burn some coals and put and some, barbecue put some, some meat stuff. or fish on it I guess yes or veggies Corn? I, I'm going to guess moat corn. Well, yeah, you can grill it. Grill Actually, corn? that's the revolution Zucchini? of the last two or three years for professional chefs. Yeah. Is the barbecuing, slow cooking, roasting, and smoking of vegetables. Whole pineapples, whole cabbages, whole root vegetables, yeah. um, breadfruit. Um, yeah. Lots Dur of you know, just and, and treating vegetables with the same care and prestige as meat. And by massaging them with heat in the right ways, you can get these things that you just never knew. It only begins with roasted Brussels sprouts, what, what can be done. So. I didn't know you massaged with it. It's like yeah. I'm thinking heat rocks on the vegetables. Yes, of course. That's... <laughs> yep. so. Okay. Yeah, anyway. so I assume most of you have the fourth off, but I'm not going to assume that all of you do. So yeah. Some of you are probably working. I usually cook for 500 to 1,000 people. Now you cook for us. Yeah, I'm going to take the day off on yeah. Thursday. So. Yeah, so we're going to work on projects here, maybe even uh, have a D day. Grilled cucumber sounds a little challenging. Huh, um, I haven't done grilled, that We cucumber. did a lot of grilled avocados, which was new to me a number of years ago. Um, it's not bad. It, it, it's a quick, you know, operation to char an avocado. I did a lot of grilled fruit, grilled peaches. Well, I like the Spanish version of the corn on the cob mm -hmm. with the mayonnaise. Um, what is the name of it? Well, elote is, yeah. is corn, but it's a it's, street corn. It's a, yeah. People at Costco is selling that off the cob, jumbled together with all the flavorings, frozen in a tub, and calling it street corn. Really? I, I, I'm not sure they quite got that right. Got the right. concept? Yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure about that one. I have not even considered purchasing it. Yeah, no. It seemed like it's got to be on the cob. It's not like an overpriced disaster. And it's got to be fresh. It really needs to be fresh. Um, okay, anyway, grilled avocado. Never heard of that. Uh, yeah, it's, so you grill it quickly, it warms it up and give it a sear mark. Another thing we did a lot with 
Yeah, is grilling uh, peaches and stone fruits, which for some of you will be in season, and for the rest it will be soon. That's a great way, Grilled and then asparagus. you can cut them up and put them over, um, put them over ice cream or other things. Grilled asparagus is pretty good, although the French will kick you out of France for grilling asparagus <laughs> because you need to peel peeled? asparagus because the inside mushes um, before the outside ever comes close to tenderizing. So, well, if you peel the really super jumbo, you can get away with grilling it. But yeah. the French will probably frown at you for that, but the Americans do an yeah. okay job with it. Yeah, yeah we grilled lots of jumbo asparagus, but we also peeled cases and cases of jumbo asparagus. Yeah. Okay. We cucumber. Should... Yeah, I got to look at yeah. that. Grilling cucumber. Big... So you said Big Bear Homestead. We'll have to look it up. Yeah, I subscribe to Big Bear. Yeah. I occasionally see some of their stuff. Yeah. Um, but but grilled, grilled peaches are a hit. They need to be not bitter, and they need to be approaching ripe, but not ripe, because they'll stick to the grill and fall apart. They need to have yeah. some structure. Yeah. Same with the avocados. Avocado is a little riper than the peaches, though. So. Okay, guys. Let's call it an evening. It's quarter after 10, and I do have to work tomorrow, probably. I got to work, too. Yeah. Um, so we will see you next week with our dessert topic and hopefully a video or maybe even two this week because we have, I have Thursday off, so maybe I can work on one. Um, so I will, well, we will see you next week. I hope you guys have a great 4th of July. And lots of yummy food. Good night. Good night.